There's a place deep in the mountains of East Tennessee where I have a cabin. I go there every year, sometimes three or four times a year, just to get away from everything. I work from home, so most people roll their eyes and ask what exactly I'm trying to get away from. It's not like I have to deal with the morning rush hour traffic to get to work or listen to the incessant office chatter and gossip all day or even deal with the evening traffic to get back home. Maybe they're right to roll their eyes, but does it really matter? The property is mine. I should be able to visit there as often as I'd like. I could even live there full time if I wanted to. And just a few years ago, I did want to live there. I had made up my mind that I was going to leave behind the noisy neighbors with their constant arguing, loud music in the middle of the night and all night drinking parties over the weekends, screaming kids. All that just comes from my closest neighbor. There are several houses on the street, and I swear, none of them know what bedtime is. So over the years, I figured out if they can't sleep, neither will I. They make sure their arguments and parties are loud enough to wake the dead. It's that misery loves company adage. I took my autumn holiday to the cabin that year, thankful to be away from the neighborhood. I thought if I heard one more screaming tantrum from a kid, my head would explode. In the Toyota, I watched the neighborhood shrink in my rear view. The smile on my face grew in direct proportion to the distance between me and those hellions who lived there. The mountain road to the cabin was really no more than a badly carved out trail, barely wide enough for the Toyota, and the dirt had deep ruts that pitched the truck side to side as I let it barely crawl up the road. Was it annoying? <laughs> Hell yeah. Was it bad for my truck? Well, I'd venture a guess that it probably was. Was it necessary to leave the road in that condition? In my opinion, yes. It greatly reduced the likelihood of vandals getting to the cabin. Nothing could ruin a good little vacation like getting to the cabin and finding that someone had broken windows, pried a door and gone inside, or spray painted a wall, you know, any number of things. I had installed wooden shutters over the windows years earlier to help protect the place while I was away, but it didn't always work. But this time, the cabin stood unmolested by vandals and wildlife alike. This was going to be one of my best vacations there. I could just tell when I parked in front of the house and the gray overhanging clouds immediately began to peel back and let the bright fall sunlight shine like a spotlight on my driveway. Over the years, the split cedar logs had taken on a forest patina that camouflaged the place in fall. Its faded browns and rich orange undertones with patchworks of vines and mosses made it seem like part of the forest instead of separate from it. My late wife used to say it was like a mammoth copperhead lying hidden in plain sight. Then she would just laugh nervously and say that she hoped it never decided to strike out at us. I missed my wife. I missed her a lot. Everything told me that time would ease the pain in my heart, but that never happened. She was taken from this world in a terrible car accident 22 years ago, and the pain in my heart is still the same. Maybe I started visiting the cabin more often after her death so I could mourn her in peace. Or maybe I went just to connect to her memories a bit more. Hell, I'm not sure. But my memories of her were always sharper and more vivid when I was at the cabin. There was no electricity there, no phone either. There were a couple of fireplaces, there was a gas stove and plenty of oil lamps and candles. Not that I needed the lights at night much. I was in bed at sundown and up with the sunrise most of the time. For the first couple of days, I would make certain I charged my cell phone in the truck and I kept the phone in my pocket no matter where I ventured. Usually by day three, I would be comfortable enough that I didn't keep up with it as much. I don't like the damn thing anyway. Quite honestly, it's a nuisance. By day three, 
I had settled in nicely. The silence was so complete that a high-pitched ringing filled my ears. I always thought of that as my brain trying to fill in the blank spaces where screaming kids and parents blasting rock music and revving muscle car engines had been. By day four, I was beginning to think how nice it would be to simply pack up and move to the cabin. I could keep the laptop charged with the charging packs and still be able to work. Go to town once a week to use the free Wi-Fi signal at the library and send in my work. That evening, I heated up soup and ate in front of the low fire I had laid in the living room fireplace. The small logs popped and cracked, and the low orange glow threw ambient dancing light across the room to stretch and shrink shadows against the far wall. It was hypnotic, like watching the world's strangest puppet show in silhouette. Now I was aware that my eyes were zoning out. My eyes lost their sharp focus on the individual shadows, and my gaze drifted naturally toward the window. Leaves drifted down in autumn-colored clouds. Crows cawed and strutted around on the ground. The wind soughed through the trees and curled around the corners of the house, sighing like a lover as it passed by. My muscles relaxed, and I let the serenity carry me away for a while. Some time later, I started awake in my chair and dumped the remainder of my soup onto the wooden floor. The sun had set and my fire had died to glowing embers. Fumbling out of my seat, I went to the mantle to light an oil lamp. The shadows were no longer hypnotic and fanciful. They were bloated, lumbering, and menacing as they jumbled together low on the opposite wall. I hurriedly lit the other two lamps and turned the flames high, not wanting to admit even to myself that those shadows had scared me more than a little. I was too old for such flights of fancy. Only kids were supposed to be scared of shadows, right? I lit candles and lamps in the kitchen, and then made quick work of cleaning up the spilled soup. The wind had kicked up outside instead of sighing. It howled like a faraway wolf as it rounded the corners. A chill ran up my arms as I bent to the mess with my back to the empty room. And that was the first time I ever remember being scared at the cabin. That fear increased monumentally when I had to douse the candles and lamps so I could go to bed. I carried a lamp, raising it high over my head as I ascended the stairs. There were three bedrooms up there, thankfully. Mine was two long strides from the landing. I nearly ran into my room and slammed the door. Now, logic told me I was just being a ninny as I locked the door and put the lamp on the high boy. I checked the tiny closet and under my bed before I crawled under the covers. I didn't douse that lamp either. I laid there, clutching the covers, wondering what exactly had scared me so badly. You'd think by 45, all your fears would be of wealth and finances, but... Don't get your hopes up, kids. Those were the last things on my mind. I finally rolled to my side and scrooched my back to the wall and fell asleep. I think I dreamed of every dead relative I had that night. They weren't good dreams either. And the next morning, I woke feeling drained. As I sat in the thin morning light coming through the kitchen window, lost in thought, something banged and I nearly jumped out of my seat. I followed the sound to the living room, where a shutter tapped the house lightly in the breeze. Laughing, I made my way out there to secure the damn thing before it gave me another fright. As I turned the corner, I noticed the ground had been scuffed underneath the window, as if something had been digging there. I looked to the forest and back to the marks in the dirt. There were coyotes and bears, badgers, foxes, and maybe even a few wolves out there. Now bears and coyotes became my immediate concern. I hooked the shutter open and peered in the window. There was a slimy looking smudge just above my eye level. It hadn't been there when I had opened the shutters days before, and I haven't noticed any animal activity. 
But the only image my mind could conjure was of a bear licking the glass. Now, tentatively, I touched the smudge with the tip of my finger, and it came away with a clear, sticky substance. Think, I don't know, slug slime, and you'll have a pretty good idea of what it was like. It was simultaneously a relief, and scary that maybe the bear had been what had scared me so badly. I had surely picked up on the thing's movements subconsciously, and had been right to be afraid. Now that evening, I closed the shutters on the first floor windows. I didn't need a nosy bear breaking in a window. I laid a small fire again. That night, though, I ate my supper in the kitchen. I listened to the fire consuming the wood and watched jigging shadows in the other room. There was no shortage of light as I had lit several lamps, even leaving one burning at the top of the stairs. I put my bowl in the sink, not liking the blocked window in front of me. The sun was almost set, and I wanted to get ready for bed. No more late nights full of jangled nerves for me if I could help it. I doused the nearest lamp, and that's when I heard the faint, unnatural scraping noise. I stood still, holding my breath as I listened. And it came again barely audible just outside the living room window. I edged toward the living room, trying to stay quiet. The scratching grew louder as I passed through the living room toward the stairs. I wanted to see what was out there, but had to go up to the bedroom next to mine to look down. The two spare rooms were dark, their doors closed. I moved through the darkness carefully. There was a definite chill in the air that let me know winter was on its way. Pressing my face to the glass, I tried to look straight down but couldn't make anything out. I had to open the window and lean out, and I was shocked at what I saw. The thing scratching at the ground looked like a brown bear with a bad case of mange, except on its head. There were plenty of thick long hair. The body was long and skinny for a bear, but I thought maybe it was sickly, unable to eat properly. And I don't know how long I stood there, leaning out of that window, staring at the thing, trying to come up with a rational explanation for it. But I know how long it took me to retreat and close the window when it stood up on two legs and looked at me. Its head and shoulders looked like a bear. It even had bear-like paws with long, black claws. But its lower body looked human, with human feet and legs. The full moon and the cloudless sky gave me a decent view of the beast. A better view than I ever wanted, actually. The cold light reflected silvery from its dark eyes, and white puffs of condensation billowed from its elongated snout as it sniffed up at me. Time seemed to be suspended, stretched, and slowed to a crawl as we locked eyes, but in reality, it lasted only the span of one quick intake of a breath for me, and I was inside, slamming that window shut. Now, for several moments, I was completely frozen in place, unable to think what I should do first. My cell phone was in my bedroom. I grabbed it and went down the stairs to the coat closet and retrieved the rifle that I kept in there. That old thing hadn't been used in five years, give or take. I stuffed the box of ammo into my jeans pocket and walked to the living room on rubber legs. There were two doors, and I had locked them down before making my supper, but I checked them again all the same. The first floor was completely secure. Well... As secure as wood can be, I suppose. The thought that only wooden shutters and a piece of glass separated me from the thing out there did nothing to help the situation. If it wanted in bad enough, it could get in. And just then, a deathly silence enveloped the cabin. The only sound was of the low crackling in the fireplace. The quiet had been filled with a terrible sense of dread. Like the moment in a horror movie just before the monster in the closet lurches out, 
proving it's real. The wind moaned under the eaves and I began to sweat. Dry leaves rustled against the kitchen door like tiny bones rattling against coffin walls. I lowered my gun and held it in the crook of my arm as I fished the cell phone out of my back pocket. There was one bar of signal and I dialed 911. The call didn't go through though. I tried three more times but it wouldn't connect. The signal was too weak. I had to go back upstairs to get a better signal, but that meant leaving the lower level unsupervised. If that creature got inside while I was upstairs and I couldn't kill it, there was nowhere for me to go, except for out a window. I didn't like that, but I went to the landing and tried the call again. Still, no luck. At this point, I didn't understand that. I thought all 911 calls went through. I guess that was just a rumor, though. The wind gusted harder, rattling the shutters. I felt sick as I stepped into my room and walked to the window where the signal had always been strongest. The meter bounced between two and three bars. I punched the number again, but before I could raise the phone to my ear, I heard a low, guttural growl in the hallway. My insides turned to water. I gently laid the phone on the nightstand and turned to the doorway, fully expecting to see the creature standing there, proving its existence to me. But the doorway was empty. An operator came on the phone, but I didn't pick it up. I hoped that they would run a trace and send someone to check out the call. Moving to the center of the room, I leveled my gun barrel at the open door and tried to calm the shaking in my arms and chest. I heard the thing snuffling in the next room, the room I had been in when I saw it on the ground. My brain was stripping gears trying to figure out how it had gotten inside without me hearing it. The bed squeaked loudly as the thing leaped onto it, took a couple of steps, and then thumped back to the floor. The chair at the vanity scooted across the wood floor noisily, and the snuffling exploration continued. I knew I had to leave my room and do something, but I didn't know what to do. Should I try to trap it in there, shutting the door, and run for my truck? In the moonlight, my keys glinted coldly at me from the nail on the wall by the door. Were they beckoning me, urging me, or just daring me? If the thing was strong and healthy, it could survive being shot by my rifle. After all, it was just a twenty-two, nothing remotely big. My only option seemed to be shutting it in and running or trying to kill it with the gun. Neither one sounded like it was a good idea to me. Before long, I was certain that the creature would lose interest in the spare bedroom and come out, leaving me with less of a chance than I had at that moment. I quietly put the keys in my pocket, taking three quick deep breaths. I stuck my head out of the door just to make sure it was still in the room. And then I bolted. The most terrifying moment came when I had to lunge into the darkness to grab the doorknob. The beast gave an indignant howl as the door slammed in the jam hard enough to knock pictures off the wall. And I don't know that my feet even touched a step on the way down. I slammed into the kitchen door, fumbled with the locks as the creature screams, moved from the spare room to the landing. My fingers would not undo the chain lock, and in my terror, I ripped the door open, breaking the screws out of the anchoring side. My next memory is of being inside the truck and not being able to get the key in the ignition. I had to use both hands, they were shaking so bad. The headlights popped on, blindingly bright in the darkness, and the creature leaped backwards on all fours, ducking its head and snarling in the lights. But it didn't stop its advance. It tossed its head side to side the way a pissed off bull will do right before it charges. I revved the engine and tried to get the stick into first gear, but kept grinding it instead. The creature pawed at the ground, sending up great whirls of dirt and dead leaves as it neared. Finally, I had the truck in gear. It bunny hopped as I let the clutch out too suddenly, but by second gear, I was moving smooth. 
The creature stood on its human-like legs, curled its bare paws in towards its chest, leaned forward and roared as I sped away. My truck took a real beating that night. So did I. The ruts in the road tossed me around like a ping-pong ball in a giant martini shaker. But somehow, I managed to make it off that mountain in one piece. And I've never gone back. As far as I know, the 911 operator might have stayed on the line until the phone died. I never called them back to report anything. And no one in law enforcement ever contacted me either. But... If you know anyone interested in owning their own little getaway cabin on a mountain, you know, just for vacation or something, you let me know. I've got one I'll sell you real cheap. <laughs>